Okay, let's start. That's the last session for today, except the closing keynote. And uh, I'd like to bring us down to Earth from all the clouds, edge, serverless. Well, it's actually going to be some kind of serverless, actually. Uh, but let's talk about good old client-server architecture and how it relates, it can be related to Vasm. So we're going to talk about Rails, Ruby on Rails, which is a bit surprising, I guess, for most of the attendees of these conferences, because Rails is a full-stack, anti-cloud web framework. And what does it have to do with Vasm? Let me start answering this question by telling a bit about myself and what I'm doing. Uh, my, okay. So my name is Vladimir Ovova. I'm an open source developer. I mostly focused on Ruby and Go, but also related to Ruby side. So kind of boring server side stuff, nothing interesting. But I found a place, uh, but I'm being paid for doing open source at a company called Evil Martians. And that's our legal name. That's not a nickname. We're consultancy. We're helping startups mostly of different size and age. Uh, some of them are not only already not startups anymore, but anyway, mostly in developer tools uh, uh, specialization. And uh, that's where we actually first time met Vasm in production in the project called StackBlades. A few words about StackBlades. StackBlades is a in browser IDE uh, that's built on top of web containers technology, which is, of course, built on top of Vasm. And it allows you to run full stack Node.js applications right within your browser. So both parts, a server, a client, and everything it just works. Everything is great. And we've been working with them for quite a while already. And we started thinking at some point that, oh, would it be nice to have something similar for our favorite language, Ruby? So we started investigating and we built a kind of minimalistic Stackblades like playground for Ruby called Run Ruby Dev. It also allows you to install dependencies on the fly, run Ruby code, manage files, and so on, and all within the browser. And actually, it turned out that running Ruby in the browser, like a server side framework uh, language, is not a big deal anymore. Uh, because about two years ago, Ruby officially started to support Vasm builds and Vasi. So uh, at this point, it's currently only Vasi P1, but P2 is coming soon. So Ruby is Vasm uh, compliant, and we can use it everywhere where we can use Vasm. But coming back to the topic, Ruby on Rails. It's more than just Ruby, right? It's a web framework, and web framework is just a Part of it is a language, and there are many other components. So let's take a look at these components. First, of course, we have a platform, a language, and uh, that's Ruby in our case. Then we have dependencies, libraries. they call called gems in Ruby world. Some gems rely on native extensions, written in C or Rust. But that's not a big deal in terms of Vasmification, because that's already covered by the official Ruby Wasm build, so we can manage dependencies, the native extensions, well, not all of them, but most, could be compiled into the Vasm module. So that's good. But that's not the, the whole stack of the Rails application. We have some system level dependencies, some native tools, like, for example, for processing images or dealing with some other stuff. We have, of course, database, right? We need to deal with databases. We need a web server to handle HTTP requests because it's a HTTP-oriented framework. We need a storage to keep user-generated files or assets to serve, uh, like JavaScript and CSS and so on. We also have background tasks, and we need some kind of a queue implementation to manage them. And we usually call external APIs from our web application nowadays. They're not like closed systems. For all of these components, we need to figure out how to put all of them into browser, right? Because that's, that's actually the most important part of the web application, the system as a whole. But we deal with the framework. And usually framework, what is, what is a framework? Uh, framework is a combination of some abstractions ready to use. There's just pure code abstractions, some concepts, whatever. 
and infrastructure to, uh, for these abstractions to use particular implementations. And a good framework clearly separates those two. So you can easily switch from RAM implementation to another without sacrificing your application code. That's what, in my opinion, defines uh, a good for frameworks. So how good is Rails? Well, I would say Rails is almost perfect. Most of the components are heavily abstracted away from their implementations and backed by the corresponding like, sub-frameworks, but there are still some parts of the Rails application that are not uh, really could be separated from the implementations. First is a bundler, it's our package manager. Well, it's not a part of Rails, it's part of Ruby, but uh, we need to figure out how to deal with it uh, when we go to the browser. And then it's, for example, an HTTP library, which is a library for performing HTTP requests. And um, good thing about Ruby, if we have something not abstracted away, we can just patch it. Whether it's a third-party library, a standard library, a Ruby VM itself, Ruby allows you to kind of tweak any part of the runtime. And this, together with the Rails architecture, makes Rails on Wasm possible. So let's see uh, how we can bring Rails from Hello World to the browser in just a few minutes. Well, I gotta show you a quick demo of creating a new Rails application and turning it into a fully self-contained Bosm application that could be executed anywhere. So, yeah, my demo is pretty quick. I'm not gonna cope life coding. So we created a Rails application. Rails new creates a lot of stuff, especially this since the last version that just arrived like a few days ago. We have everything from databases to deployment. We don't need most of this stuff, but let's keep it. Then we generate uh, some models for our application. So we're building a ReviewCon app, an application that allows you to see the list of talks and left some rating and write some comments or whatever, some just random demo I come up with. So with a few commands, you can generate this scaffolded app, like we call it in Rails, so just some boilerplate, like list, some forms for creating records, for updating them, and so on. That's kind of the basic application we have. Now, uh, just a tiny bit of beauty, beauty. We can make it look good with the help of some AI tools. No worry about it. So that's the application we're gonna port to the browser. So basically just two screens and a few actions, nothing special. And to do that, we also don't need to actually write any code, just execute some commands. So we use the Vasmify Rails toolkit. So it's a kind of a package that brings Vasm compatibility to Rails and a set of commands to generate all the required stuff. So it compiles Ruby along with all the dependencies into the Vasm module. You see like it package all the dependencies so it could be discovered by the Ruby VM within Vasm. Then we generate a simple launch or boot application. It's just a JavaScript application with an index HTML and a service worker definition. Uh, a few words about it in a second. And that's how it works. It initializes a Rails app, and it's ready to work in your browser. So the same app, just without any code changes, runs locally. So um, one point, we can also add some what's important, like when you're building a hybrid application, for example. The application knows when it runs on Vasm or in a regular server environment, so you can disable some features or tweak their behavior if you're running in a separate platform. And here, we just reload the app in the browser and we can see the changes in effect. So that's a very quick demo of bringing Rails to the browser. It just demonstrates that it's possible you can Try it yourself. It's actually available uh, online. But don't use your mobile device yet because it's likely to crash because Safari has some problems with stack size with Ruby. Well, we're gonna talk about it probably in the QA session. Uh, let's dig into some details maybe, how the things work. So we, let's go back to our architecture diagram. 
We have many pieces that are not yet, well, vast uh, ready in terms of Rails, how we do that. Let's talk about the database. So that's simple. Rails today is bet, bet all in on SQLite. Everything runs, every component of Rails uses SQLite. And SQLite has an official WASM board. So we just create a separate database adapter, like it's called uh, in Rails, SQLite WASM. Uh, and it's just uh, like a couple hundred lines of code because we can reuse most of the functionality of the server side, like SQLite adapter that use C bindings uh, to create our own because it's only ended up with just a single call to the outer world to exact actual queries against the database. And for that, we use a JavaScript interface, which is available in Ruby Basel. The actual interface is pretty simple. We just define a couple of functions to, and format the output in the form uh, we want to, w that the Rails app understands. Similarly, we can do with Postgres and PGLite. And from the Rails application perspective, it's just changing the adapter in the configuration file. So you don't need to change anything else. It's gonna just work. Yes, you have to manage the database yourself and the browser or whatever runtime you use it, but that's out of scope of the Rails app. Um, another important component is a web server. And uh, here we use a service worker. So service workers allows you to intercept HTTP requests. That's a fetch event. And what we do is we implement a common interface uh, for Ruby applications to serve HTTP. So every Ruby web application uses this REC interface and we just re-implement it in JavaScript. That's, well, a lot of Ruby related in JavaScript code. It doesn't matter what's inside, but actually it just translates JavaScript request response objects to REC response request objects and back and forth. So, and that's it. Now, since we have a common interface at the Ruby side, and we have a translator at the JavaScript side, we just use it and our service worker serves requests for the Rails app running within WASM. There are, of course, some tricky parts like how to serve files, how to handle multi-part form updates, how to manage cookies. We managed to kind of serve all of them, but that required some hackery. And of course, uh, whenever WASM p 2 is gonna be ready for Ruby, we're gonna just ship an HTTP proxy implementation for Rails, so, and probably find some uh, universal service worker that's gonna just work with any app, not only uh, Ruby and Rails app. That's kind of the plan for the future. So we have a few more components, and uh, not gonna go into deep because I think you figure out the idea. So we have a component in the framework which supports uh, different adapters, different implementations. We just write implementation that is WASM ready and use it. So for storage, we can use file system API in the browser or origin private file system, which is really good for that use case. For background threads and communication between them, broadcast channel API is uh, working good. Um, we, we can even process images right within the browser using WASM ports of WIPs or image magic. So everything is possible. Everything is a uh, bit tricky today because we're just in the very beginning of this journey, but uh, I hope as the VASM evolves and Rails adapts, we're gonna be able to do that much easier. So as a result of my work of this, I wrote a handbook, it's still in progress, with all the recipes and guides on how to deal with particular problems related to running Rails in the browser in different modes like offline first, offline aware apps and so on. Uh, the good thing about this app, it's also running within browser as well as a fallback because it's served by a Rails application. So it's both a guide and an example. Uh, you can check it out because, well, it contains a lot of hackery around Vasm in the browser. But the biggest question and the question I think everyone's asking from the very first moment I mentioned Rails. Uh, why? So, <laughs> like, you know, um, I, I, well, I started talking about this stuff like early this year and the feedback is kind of different. Like some people say, oh, wow, 
I couldn't even imagine running Rails within a browser. That's cool. Yeah, that's cool. And there are some skepticism as well. Let's call it like that, like a British skepticism. Uh, oh, why do you need to compile a dynamic language into a bus with like a VM, with like an interpreter, whatever, whatever? It's going to be slow. It's going to be, you know, uh, heavy, like hundreds of megabytes. No one needs it. Just use Rust. Like whatever. Well, I think all the points regarding the bundle size, like module size, sorry, or slow or not, are not worth it because they're just temporary. The technology is evolving and we see like we just had Bazi P2, not everyone yet, era and it's many, many levels before even Bazi reached 1.0 and uh, the runtimes are evolving as well. Like GC and threads maybe someday going to be there. And most of these problems are going to be solved. And um, we just need to keep pace with the evolution of the technology, be prepared for that, and start looking for real like use cases for bringing full-featured web frameworks into browsers or other WebAssembly runtimes. Um, but why I'm doing this? Well, I'm doing this just because it's fun, like, you know, because uh, solving problems that no one even tried to solve is always uh, inspiring. That's what makes me uh, still be in a software engineer and not someone else. So that kind of work. Uh, and another that I already kind of mentioned, it's for pushing boundaries of, for both sides. I want to make Rails be aware of this esoteric use cases and make it be compatible so to, to stay a good framework with clear separation of abstractions and implementations. And I want to VASM developers to be aware of this use cases. VASM is not only for, well, not browsers, but clouds, right, today. Uh, there are more use cases for VASM. And that's the point of VASM, right, being portable and interoperable. And of course, there are some practical applications, I think, that could be, uh, uh, could benefit from going to the browser, closer to the browser. First of all, it's not really applications, but what I call it's like try, learn, reproduce apps. Everything related to educational, like tutorials, um, bug reproduction scripts, online playgrounds, uh, where we can just take, a, you know, for example, try a new library and experiment with it with a, within the browser without installing and figuring out how it works. That's uh, really, well, I, I, I think that's the most beneficial uh, point of bringing uh, software to the browser, so make it uh, more accessible. Of course, there are some offline aware applications, I call them. So the application that would benefit from having more than just static HTML served when you're offline, but allowing you to interact with the browser, maybe some data intensive application like email clients. So you can browse your history, search, and so on. Uh, there is a category I call like data, par data paranoid apps. So like you don't want to keep your data anywhere, only on your machine, but still want to use some interface and call some external APIs, for example, to pull data or synchronize in an encrypted form. And there are, of course, there are, also, there are also desktop apps. I think like Rails is a great framework uh, because of its active record component that allows you to describe business logic in a very concise way and manipulate all the data. And that could be uh, helpful to improve the productivity for desktop application builders. So my point here is don't stop thinking about server-side frameworks as the thing that could be only executed on your server somewhere in the cloud or in the data center or whatever. Server-side just means the role of the software and the communication. It's not the place where it's going to be executed. So you can, your browser is also could be your server. Uh, that I think that's all of my talk, my two talks, the lightning talks, but we still have time for questions if you have some. I'm pretty sure uh, there could be some if you followed the talk. Uh, but that's it. Thank you. Yes. 
so, yeah, so, sorry. Yeah, that's, go, go ahead. Right, so in that case, I have, I'm thinking of a scenario of, um, like, yes, you can have local first application, but like, what, what, uh, what happens when this application is supposed to serve multiple users in a like collaboration kind of, like real time kind of feature? Uh, and how, how do you deal with the persistence of their data? Yeah, yeah uh, that's a good question. So. Uh, let me re uh, repeat it. So first question is the whole Rails application runs within the browser? Yes, that's a whole Rails app in a single VASP volume for now. Hello. And the second question, how to deal with, uh, I would say like data synchronization between users when it's not a personal application, but it's a multiplayer application. So um, yeah, so that's, there are a few strategies um, depending on the level where you want to implement the synchronization. I mentioned PG Lite. So PG Light uh, is a project developed by the Electric SQL company or, or whatever. So they offer this uh, data synchronization at the database layer. So basically you connect your PG Light in the browser to your server via Electric SQL protocol, whatever. And it synchronizes the data between clients automatically. So you have an instance, uh, like a Postgres instance, like server instance, like master's instance. And it allows you selectively synchronize data between clients and so on. So, so that's one of the approach. You can use PG Lite for that. Uh, also, we, we talked just yesterday with Couchbase folks. And actually with CouchDB and Couchbase, you can achieve the same result because it also allows replication, automatic replication of data between databases, server side and client side. That's one of the options. So it's a database level. And uh, there are other options at the application level what you can do, but that requires some changes to your architecture. So you can go all in, all in with event sourcing and uh, model every interaction you have as an event, and then you just replicate logs of the event between the client and server. You need to deal with conflict resolution and figure out this part, but that's, I think that's depends on the application and what level of synchronization you want to achieve, because in some cases, you probably the potentially conflicting changes could be just disallowed at the local version. So like you, your, your local version is kind of, have, might have limited set of features. So you think that, oh, this is something that's not gonna work offline. So let's just disable this and let, us, um, let user and also go back online and work with this. So I think the, there should be compromise without, with, I, I don't really trust in the full featured local first stuff when everything is locally and then it's synchronized, I think uh, what I, that's why I call it like offline aware applications, that you have subset of features available to the local copy, and uh, then uh, you have a server. You're still the primary use case when you want to collaborate with someone is going online. So that's, uh, that's a primary use case for this, I think. But at the data, le data level, you can probably sync data, but well, I, I, don't, I don't know how it's gonna work on a larger project. So like all these demo projects were great, but <laughs> whenever we go into something real, that uh, could be tricky. But there is another option. You can just make parts of the application available in the VASM build, so not everything. So that also, like, like in the example, uh, I show this, uh, I can come back. So the book, it's a, just a Rails application serving markdown. And uh, the offline version just has all the contents, including images and so on. And you can read it whenever you want. So like make available offline for like, a feature could be implemented this way. Um, and you don't need to do any changes in your code except from probably configuring your roads or whatever. So this is, could be usable online and this only, like offline and this only online. So would you say I need to swap out the SQLite uh, implementation because that's only for the local version? Um, I would swap out for something like PG Lite that you... Um, yeah, speaking of databases, you, so the question is, if you want to have multiple application, can you still use SQLite? Well, um, so for SQLite, there are also projects like SQLite related that allow you to replicate data between databases like Lightstream. I haven't heard of Lightstream being ported to VASM, but I think that's actually possible. So, and that means that even with SQLite, you can also achieve some level of synchronization. But the question is always dealing with conflicts and how long you can go offline and so on. So for every 
independently or whatever you use to build your offline first application or local first, uh, dealing with this uh, stale clients is uh, always a problem. But you can implement, as I said, a synchronization at the application level by using like a replication log in your uh, own code. So that could work. And maybe uh, in your, there could be cases uh, that where only, like most users are heavily read-only users. So then do not, or they modifications, for example, when I'm reading a book or watching videos, I'm not changing any information related to other users. So I'm updating my progress, for example, some views count or whatever. So this could be safely re, re kind of replicated by just re reissuing HTTP requests. You can just keep them in the log locally. And then whenever you're online, you just serve them, uh, send them again to the real server to reflect the changes. So that's another strategy 